Good morning, church. Uh, good morning to all of our visitors. If this is your first time here and you don't know who I am, my name is Jacob Partridge. I'm one of the deacons here at Eastview, and uh, I'll be filling in for Pastor Hunter uh, while he and his family are away on a vacation this weekend. So uh, we often hear, just to tell you what I'm wanting to relay to you so you can be listening for it, I'm going to go ahead and tell you the bottom line up front. So what I want you to hear is that we as Christians, we're supposed to do works. We often hear, you know, you're not supposed to have a works-based faith, and that is very true. We don't do works to earn our salvation. There's no way you can do that. The Bible is clear about that. But once saved, we are called to action. Okay, and that's what I want you to hear today while I go through this. Uh, hold on, I forgot to share my slides with Stoney. All right, we're good now. Okay, so uh, while running earlier this week with Pastor Hunter, Monday morning, about a quarter mile into it, he says, Hey, Jacob, do you want to preach for me this week? And uh, he fell into the same mistake that my wife often makes there. He asked me if I wanted to. And when Leah asked me something like that, do you want to do the dishes for me? Of course, there's multiple sides to that coin. Obviously, I love my wife and I want to do stuff for her. But no, I don't desire to get up and do the dishes. I'd rather sit in the recliner and watch the football game. Same thing when Pastor Hunter asked me if I wanted to preach. The first feeling that flooded my mind was how overwhelmed I was and honored that he trusted me enough to turn this pulpit over to me this morning. And then immediately it hit me that God trusts me enough to put it on his heart to, to stand behind this pulpit and preach to you this morning. And that was extremely overwhelming. And so obviously the answer was going to be yes from the beginning. But there is another side to that. I started thinking about, and I'm an overthinker, so we made it about a half a mile down the road before I responded. And uh, he started to get worried, and he started to say, well, if you're not going to say yes, I'll just have to talk you into it. But uh, the other side of that is I respect God's Word so much, and I want it to be treated rightly. And, and, and I, I respect it that much that I know it's a huge responsibility, and I want to present it well to you. And then there's also that, that aspect of who am I to do this? And the who am I, it, it's funny, I told Hunter this while we were running still. Uh, we had to run a long time that day. But uh, <laughs> last week, a group of men met. We were going to talk about starting this Bible study on Tuesday mornings. And uh, I was talking to Jeremy Jones and Drake Whitworth about that exact thing. And I told Hunter, I was like, we were just discussing this. Who am I? You know, look at the men that are in this church. Who am I to stand up here and tell y'all anything about it? There's so many knowledgeable, good, godly men. And, and when you start comparing yourself to people, it, it's, it's hard to say that I'm worthy to do this. So uh, when I got home, I started thinking about what I wanted to discuss and the who am I question. So who in the Bible had that same question? I started looking and it didn't take long. I, first thing that popped up in my head was Moses. So if you look in Exodus 3.11, he says right here, and this is Moses talking to God at the burning bush, but Moses said to God, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and that I should bring the children of Israel out of Egypt? So um, a wise man once told me something. This man has been a friend from my youth, and he's now my boss. Uh, Hunter Ward, I, I remember having a conversation with him about a crop insurance claim. Uh, and I found out some information about this claim that, that put us in a hard spot. And I knew I was going to have to do something, but it wasn't really something I was wanting to do. And so I asked Hunter about this, and I'll never forget his response. He said, Jacob, usually if you have to ask the question, you already didn't know the answer. So the same goes here. If I'm asking the question of who am I, I already know that answer. Okay, the last two sermons uh, Pastor Hunter preached were about our worth. Two weeks ago, he talked about the, the laws of value. He said, condition matters. The buyer sets the value, and most importantly, it's all about the buyer's desire. 
So God paid the highest price for us. So it doesn't matter what I think I'm worth. He thinks I'm worth an awful lot. So last week, Pastor Hunter discussed how God sought us out wherever we were in our sin. How a parent is willing to go anywhere to bring their child back. And then he ended his sermon talking about in Exodus how over half a dozen times within a couple of chapters, God told Moses to go to Pharaoh and say, let my people go so that. Okay, so he purchased us. You don't purchase anything without a reason. So why did he purchase us? He purchased us so that we may serve him. That's what he told Moses to tell Pharaoh. Let my people go so that they may serve me. So who are we, and more importantly, what should we do with the knowledge of knowing who we are? I'm going to go to a couple of passages here. Um, and, and we're going to dive into a, a piece in John later, but I'm going to kind of bounce around just a second. So 1 Peter 2.9 says, But you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people, that you may proclaim the praises of him. Okay, so there, there it is. We're called to action. What would it do? Proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Who once were not people, not a people, but now you are the people of God who had obtained mercy. But now, he had no mercy, but now have obtained mercy. Ephesians 2, 8 through 10 says something very similar. It says, for by grace you have been saved through faith. And that not of yourselves, it is a gift of God, not of works. So again, works can't earn you your salvation, lest anyone should boast. For we are his workmanship. So once you are saved, though, you are a workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. So to uh, answer my own question of who am I to preach, I'm God's... And uh, it, I'm not worthy to stand up here and preach anything. I'm not even worthy to have God's word come out of my mouth based on what I've done. But I'm worthy because he said I am. And he paid that price for me. So to follow Pastor Hunter's theme of the last two weeks, how do we react to salvation and knowing our worth? You know, and I could continue to go through the Bible and give you multiple scriptures similar to the last two that tell us that we're worth a lot and to tell us to go and do but I want us to dive into John 4, verses 27 through 42. So before we do that, let me pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for this day and the opportunity to speak your word to your people. Please, God, help me to remove any agenda of mine and submit myself solely to you to speak that that you would have your people hear. Please help the ones that will hear my voice to remove all of their thoughts and focus on you and your word as we worship you today through the teaching and preaching of your holy word. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. So if you would turn to John 4, starting in verse 27. So last week, Pastor Hunter preached through the first part of this chapter. And just to catch you up, the first part of this chapter, Jesus is uh, in Judea, and he's going to travel to Galilee. And if you look at a map, you've got Judea, and then you've got Samaria and then Galilee. And remember, most of the Jews would travel, they'd cross a river, travel north, and cross the river again to avoid going through uh, Samaria. Jesus did not do this. He, he went straight through because he wanted to go talk to that woman at the well. This woman at the well, he, he explained to her that he was the living water, that if you drink of this water, you'll not be thirsty again. And then he explained to her all of her sins. He, he told her, you've been married five times before and you're currently living with a man that's not your wife. He, he knew all of this about her. And then at the very end of what we read last week, she explained to him that she knew the Messiah was coming. She had that understanding. And he said, I am he. So he revealed himself to her at the very end. So we'll, we pick up there with verse 27. It says, at this point, his disciples came and they marveled that he talked with a woman. Yet no one said, what do you seek? Or why are you talking with her? So remember in this culture that a man would not normally be talking to a woman that was not his wife 
or a very close relative. Okay? And to me, this kind of sticks out that Jesus doesn't care about our culture and he doesn't care about what the world tells us is normal. He cares about his people. So verse 28, The woman left her water pot, went her way into the city and said to the men, Come see a man who told me all the things that I ever did. Could this be the Christ? So notice again, this, this woman, she dropped everything. She left her belongings behind to act on this new faith. Again, in this culture, she went to a city and talked to a bunch of men. Now, you know these men probably knew her past. Okay, Imagine in Huntington, people know your business, right? So they probably knew what, that she had been divorced five times. They knew she was living in, a, in an adulterous relationship. And they probably normally would not ever listen to her or speak to her. But she stepped out on faith, knowing that she would be looked down upon probably. And look at what the fruits of that. These men did listen to her testimony. And then they went out seeking Jesus. So what is faith? We've mentioned it a couple of times already. So faith is the belief in something that you can't necessarily prove or you can't see or touch, but you act as if it can be. Okay? There's action required in this faith. So notice the woman immediately acted. I want, I want to turn to one more passage here. 1 Peter 1, 13-14. Keep your finger in, uh, in John if you, if you want to turn to 1 Peter. But 1 Peter 1, 13-14 says, Therefore, gird up the loins of your mind. Be sober and rest your hope fully upon the grace that is to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. This woman just had Christ reveal himself to her. And she immediately acted on this new faith. Okay, so uh, as obedient children, not conforming yourselves to the former lust as in your ignorance. So this, this phrase, gird up your loins, um, that stuck with me. And just a, a little sidebar here. This past Wednesday night, uh, Leah and I teach a Bible study class for the fourth through sixth graders. And right now we're working on Bible drill. We had a few extra minutes left at the end of class, and I had them just going around the room stating what their favorite verse was, and everybody looked it up. Okay, and, and Nolan Tippett said, well, I bet Mr. Jacob's going to say that one about gird up your loin. So I guess I've used it a couple of times in the past, but I came across this uh, little picture here a couple of years ago, and it really speaks to me. And all translations don't have this gird up your loins in this verse, but, but mine does. And it speaks to me because it tells you how you should be getting ready to act for God. Okay, so just to explain it real quick, top left, there's a man there wearing a tunic that men in the Bible times would wear. You see how it comes down to his ankles? Now imagine trying to fight a battle and run across a battlefield, jump up on rocks, whatever, jump across ditches, wearing that tunic that's down around your ankles. Also, think about doing God's work. Think about... Chad Edwards and Ryan Tippett up on the rafters of that pavilion that they built last fall, wearing a tunic down to their ankles, running across those rafters like a squirrel. It wouldn't work, okay? It wouldn't. But, so what you do is you take all that extra fabric, you pull it between your legs, tie it around your waist. Now, tying it off is real important too because you need your hands available to pick up God's weapon or to pick up God's tool and do his fighting or his work. Okay, so that, that's something that's always stuck with me. Okay, again, it's preparing yourself to take action. So back to John chapter 4, verse 30. It says, Then they went out of the city and came to him. So this is the men that she went and talked to and gave her testimony. They left to go find Jesus. Now, again, a little bit of a sidebar, but it stuck with me. Why did they go outside of the city? If Jesus wanted to see all these people, why didn't he go to the town? If somebody famous came to Huntington and wanted to talk to a lot of people, they would not go to Stony DeVille's Hayfield outside of town. They would go somewhere where people are. They would go to Walmart, the courthouse, the, uh, the Dixie, the Civic Center, bring people there. So why did Jesus do this? Uh, um, and so I started digging into this. And if you look, there's a couple of verses. Here's one, just a couple of chapters to the right. This is Jesus speaking, says, No one can come to me unless the Father who sent him draws him. Um, so Jesus is saying, 
you can't seek me out. You don't come to me unless God, the Father, draws you to me. So why did, why did he draw them out of the city to Jesus? And I, I submit to you that this may be foreshadowing something that's going to happen to Jesus later. And it also points back to the Old Testament sacrificial law to show what Jesus is going to do. And it's summed up here in Hebrews 13, 11 through 14. So listen to what this says about outside the city. For the bodies of those animals whose blood is brought into the sanctuary by the high priest for sin. So remember the sacrificial law. They would kill an animal, drain its blood, and take it in and splash it on the altar to atone for the people's sin. Okay? And then they would take the body out and burn it outside. So the bodies are burned outside the camp. Therefore Jesus also, that he might sanctify the people with his own blood, suffered outside the gate. Therefore let us go forth to him outside the camp, bearing his reproach. For here we have no continuing city, but we seek the one to come. Therefore by him let us... So, okay, Jesus' blood sanctifies our sin. Now what? Let us continually offer the sacrifices of praise to God. That is, the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to his name. But do not forget to do good and to share. For with such sacrifice, God is well pleased. So back to John 4, verse 31. It says, In the meantime, his disciples urged him, saying, Rabbi, eat. Okay, so this woman goes off running into the city giving her testimony, and her, his disciples are there, and he start, they start saying, Jesus, you need to eat something. So they're just like we are. You know, they get caught up in the things of this world, uh, caught up in the physical things. They're, they're worried about him eating, and there are a lot of major spiritual things going on around him that they're oblivious to. Okay, then he, Jesus said to them, uh, I have food to eat of which you do not know. Okay, so if you go flip with me to, uh, to the right again, John 6, 27 through 35. And you get to hear about what kind of food Jesus is talking about. So John 6, 27 through 35. And Jesus is speaking here and says, Do not labor for the food which perishes, but for the food which endures to everlasting life. Which is the son of man, which the Son of Man will give you, because God the Father has set His seal on Him. Then they said to Him, "What shall we do that we may work the works of God?" So you see here, even these people know that works are part of the equation. Okay, they know that a relationship with God works is somewhere in there. It's just don't get messed up and think that your works earn your relationship with God. It's the other way around. Your relationship with God is why you do the works. So verse 29 says, Jesus answered them and said, This is the work of God, that you believe in Him who He sent. Therefore they said to Him, What sign will you perform then that we may see it and believe you? What work will you do? Our fathers ate manna in the desert, as it is written. He gave them bread from heaven to eat. Then Jesus said to them, most assuredly, I say to you, Moses did not give you bread from heaven, but my Father gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. He's speaking of himself here. They said to him, Lord, give us this bread always. And Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me shall never hunger, and he who believes in me shall never thirst. So you see, this sounds exactly like what, the, what Jesus told the woman at the well about the living water. So let, let's go back to uh, verse 33 in John 4. It says, Therefore his disciples said to one another, Has anyone brought them anything to eat? Okay, so still there, his disciples think Jesus is talking about physical food. They're not understanding that Jesus is speaking of spiritual things. Like when he was talking to the woman about the living water. She thought he was talking about a liquid she could draw up out of a hole in the ground and pour in a cup to drink. She didn't realize he was speaking of spiritual things, that he was speaking of the gospel. Now that the disciples are showing no signs of realizing what Jesus is talking about, he starts to break it down and explain it to them in verse 34. So John 4 verse 34 says, Jesus said to them, My food is to do the will of him who sent me, 
and to finish his work. So how many times have we chased after something in the world? Things that we desire greatly just to, as soon as we get those things, we feel satisfaction for a little while and then it quickly fades away. Okay, it's like eating every day. You do it three times a day and then you snack in between meals. And how long do you feel sustained and full? Not very long, you start getting hungry almost immediately. I remember I started learning this, uh, this concept when I was a, a teenager. When I got to the point where I started hunting and I started shooting, I liked guns. And uh, I had a few that, that was, honestly was all I needed. But I remember I started rabbit hunting and I had a pump, I had a 12 gauge pump action. And I was like, well, you know, I'd really like to have a double barrel. A double barrel would be nice for rabbit hunting. And I thought about this double barrel for a long time. And I, I saved money up for it. That was a big chunk of my budget back then, and I bought it. I went out and shot it for, I don't know, about a box of shells, and I went hunting a couple of times. And then what happened? I stuck that double barrel in a gun cabinet and rarely ever thought about it. And then I started thinking about the next gun I wanted. For whatever reason, I'd talk myself into it. We, we, you can do that, replace the gun in that scenario with anything in life, any of your hobbies, your work, your family even. Okay? We can put our focus on the wrong things, the things that when we achieve them, they, end up don't, they don't mean anything, okay? not in the grand scheme of things. So it's at this point in the conversation Jesus, Jesus is having with his disciples that I believe he saw that crowd coming from the city. Okay, remember in verse 28, the woman leaves to go tell her story, and then in verse 30, the men leave to come find Jesus. Well, here they come. Right here in verse 35, it says, Do you not say there are still four months, and then comes the harvest? Behold, I say to you, lift up your eyes and look at the fields, for they are already white for harvest. So I can see Jesus pointing at the crowd, saying, These men, they've had the seeds planted by the prophets, the scripture. And then this woman watered that seed with her testimony. And now they're coming. They're ripe for harvest. Look at this picture of the two wheat fields. You don't have to be a farmer to know which one of those is ready to harvest. Okay? He's telling his disciples, look at these men coming. They're ready to know me. Verse 36 says, And he who reaps receives wages and gathers fruit for eternal life, that both he who sows and he who reaps may rejoice together. For in this the saying is true, one sows and another reaps. I sent you to reap for which you have not labored. Others have labored and you have entered into their labors. So Jesus is giving his disciples their marching orders here. He's telling them how they should live out their faith and how they should serve him. By reaping the souls that are ripe for harvest. By preaching the gospel to them so that they can submit their lives to Jesus the true bread of life. So in verse 39, it ends like this. And many of the Samaritans of the city believed in him because of the word of the woman who testified. He told me that all that I ever did. So when the Samaritans had come to him, they urged him to stay with them, and he stayed there two days. And many more believed because of his own word. Then they said to the woman, Now we believe not because of what you said, for we ourselves have heard him. And we know that this is indeed the Christ, the Savior of the world. So in closing, we're to, we're to put our faith in Jesus Christ. He is our Lord and Savior. And if we have faith, that is not just a statement, that's not just a belief, but that's an action. Okay, so remember the gospel. God created everything perfect. He created man to be in communion with him. And then man messed that up. Man sinned, and we all have that in common. So then God, a plan that he created before he ever made us, he sent his son down to earth, born of a virgin, to live the perfect life that we should live. And then he died the death that we deserve. Our sins were with him whenever he went to the cross. And then he was buried. But that didn't work either because three days later he rose again to life and now he sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. And if you believe that, if you repent of your sins and you have faith, you are saved. But what are you supposed to do then? 
Go out in action. Act out your faith. Uh, so just, just remember that. Praise team, if you would come up. I want to pray a prayer of benediction. And it comes from Paul's writings in 2 Timothy 1, 8 through 9. So if you would, pray with me. God, help us to live out Paul's words when he wrote, Therefore, do not be ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me, his prisoner, but share in the suffering of the gospel by the power of God who saved us and called us to the holy calling, not because of our works, but because of his own purpose and grace, which he gave us in Christ Jesus before the ages began. Amen.